you hear me fine? Yes. Well, good. My name is Maria Davis, and I work as head of enterprise for Air Things for Business. Before I even get started, I just have to say I'm so thrilled to see you all here today. At our first ever Air Summit, but that's not the main reason. It is because we're physically together gathered in a room, and I'm not seeing you through Zoom, Teams, or Google Hangouts. So how are you all feeling today? Are you feeling like healthy, safe, and uh, productive? Yes. I need a yes, I need a yes. <laughs> I'm happy you said that because reassuring people of their safety has really never been important than it is today. Because we're going from a state of nation where people have been limited from traveling, going to restaurants, going to offices, or even going to schools or air summits like this into a full reopening, a reopening of our spaces and a more back to normal or maybe what we can call a new back to normal. People to a much larger extent need to know that they can start thriving in these environments again because our mindsets really has changed during the last one and a half years. Having hesitance related to the re reopening, it is a really reasonable feeling and it needs to be addressed. So for the next 25 minutes or so, I'm going to speak about why I believe that indoor air quality monitoring really is one of the essential pieces of reopening safely, but also how investing in IoT technology today can be harvested on in a much bigger context. So this will be a little bit repeating messaging, but I think like a good messaging never could be repeated enough. So we spend, like I even said, 90% of our time indoors in environments that are not healthy, healthy for us. We have become an, what we call an indoor generation. 90%, meaning if you multiply your age by 0 0.9, you'll get your indoor age. I've been spending 37 years of my life indoors. So if you recalculate it, you can actually find how old I am too. I wasn't aware of that, I forgot that. But, wow, I got music as well. Well, that was nice, <laughs> some extra. <laughs> so, but we spend, so if we breathe approximately every third seconds, we breathe about 28,000 times every day and over 25,000 of them are indoors in an environment that can be unhealthy for us. As we've already said, like 40,000 people die of radon, uh, lung cancer due to radon exposure every single year in US and uh, Europe. It's the second main cause of lung cancer after smoking. 262 million people suffer from asthma. And one of the main triggers is indoor air quality. According to WHO, 7 million people die every single year due to bad air. So why has it taken us so long to actually become more seriously about this topic? Why haven't we have so many underlying facts that are really self-speaking, but why haven't we actually claimed better indoor conditions for ourselves? Right now, I'm going to show you a movie uh, a clip from a movie called Network from 1976. And I'm going to tell you why I'm showing this afterwards. It's about a minute long, so bear with me. We know the air is unfit to breathe and our food is unfit to eat. We sit watching our TVs while some local newscaster tells us that today we had 15 homicides and 63 violent crimes, as if that's the way it's supposed to be. We know things are bad, worse than bad. They're crazy. It's like everything everywhere is going crazy, so we don't go out anymore. We sit in the house, and slowly the world we're living in is getting smaller, and all we say is, please, at least leave us alone in our living rooms. Let me have my toaster and my TV and my steel-belted radios, and I won't say anything. Just leave us alone. Well, I'm not going to leave you alone. I want you to get mad. I don't want you to protest. I don't want you to write. I don't want you to write to your congressman because I wouldn't know what to tell you to write. I don't know what to do about the depression and the inflation and the Russians and the crime in the street. All I know is that first, you've got to get mad. You've got to say, I'm a human being. God damn it. My life has value. So, I want you to get up now. 
I want all of you to get up out of your chairs. I want you to get up right now and go to the window, open it, and stick your head out and yell, I'm as mad as hell, and I'm not going to take this anymore. I don't know if it's a completely suitable clip, <laughs> but I think there are some parallels we can draw to this clip. But the main reason for me showing it is because I think this is what we are at the outbreak of doing right now. There are a lot of Howard Beals, who was the main character in this movie, out there starting to advocate for change. People are advocating for a change, a change in making building owners, facility managers, office managers, and government to take action and secure indoor environments because we're in indoor environments where they're expected to spend a main part of their awakening hours. So, even though we have known that every day air quality has taken over 19,000 lives globally at a normal state, and COVID at its very, very peak took 17,000, close to 17,500, it seems we actually needed the pandemic to create enough momentum in the market and awareness around the potential damage of the indoor air quality is uh, what it's doing for our health. But what has actually changed? Because during the pandemics, we have been educated every single day for over one and a half year through television, through news, through thousands of articles and front page headlines on how air can affect us. So media has really played a crucial role giving us updates and helping us mobilize and adjust to continuously new information, new recommendation and guidelines. And on top of this, we have also, it has also been backed up with a lot of science. I did a short deep dive into this, and what I found is that the first 10 months of the pandemic, scientists had published over 87,000 articles on COVID. So, and uh, whilst we at the very beginning of the pandemic were frantically sanitizing surfaces and washing our hands, scientists came to the conclusion that one of the main transmission uh, risks was airborne. And then we shifted focus. We, we, we really shifted focus in understanding what we really need to measure in our buildings. We now, we then understood that the virus thrives better within certain environments related to temperature and humidity. But we also learned that we could use CO2 as a proxy to understand if there is enough ventilation or fresh air coming into a building. This is something the government also has taken a lot of action upon. We see fundings, new regulations, and recommendations popping up all over, not only in Europe, but in US and all over the place. And I believe this is only, only the starting point. So these are some examples on how uh, new recommendations and guidelines have come. So in the Netherlands, it is now, uh, you need to document the CO2 values within, throughout the day in a classroom. It's actually a manual sheet to do that. It's not easy for a teacher to do that without help of smart sensors. In Germany, we've also gotten new guidelines related to schools, measuring CO2 and also having uh, set upon actions what to do when you reach the threshold values. The government in Germany has also um, funded with 500 million euros for schools and public buildings to either increase, uh, to um, improve their ventilation, or it also applies for CO2 sensors. In Belgium, the same. It's mandatory now to measure CO2 a lot of places. It's mandatory in fitness centers, in, ba in bars, and restaurants. And even if the threshold value, if, you, if the limits of CO2 go beyond threshold values, you actually need to close down. And at last, we've also seen just recently, UK government are funding with 25 million pounds to secure CO2 sensors in all schools. So government is taking action. But what about people that are returning to spaces and offices that are not funded? What about there? Do they have concerns? 
Well, there are multiple surveys that have been done, conducted on this to understand what are the main concerns of returning to society. And it seems that there is something cross-correlating between them. And indoor quality is at the top. Just to support this information, I have two surveys with me today. Just some of the underlying facts on the, what they have showed. So Vaisala is one of them who is the global leader within expert and environmental and industrial measurements. <laughs> so they conducted a survey with 4,000 respondents in U USA, France, Germany, and Finland. And it says that every other person is reluctant to going back to society. And it also, an indoor air quality, affects if they want to go back to public spaces or start traveling again. 50% also responded that they would feel safer if they knew more about the indoor air quality. We also have a trusted partner of ours called InfoGrid, which also is entering the stage afterwards. They also have conducted a survey for 2,000 UK employees that are returning to work to understand what their concerns are. 65% of employees seem to be more concerned now than before the pandemic. And 61% of the employees said that they would feel better if indoor air was improved. What is most concerning about this is that only 22% responded that they actually thought that their employer was going to take action on it. So not only are they concerned about their safety, but they're also concerned that their manager is not going to invest in this. This is a quote from Matt Ganser, who is VP of engineering at Carbon Lighthouse, which is an American environmental organization. And he says, instilling confidence that a building's air quality is safe will require proof. And data will be the key. I don't think I could agree more to that statement, and I also think it is an absolute truth. If we want people to embrace a reopening and go back to their offices and feel safe about sending their children to schools or start traveling or visiting public spaces again, we need to give them transparency, like we're trying to do here today with you, with our sensor. So because right now there is a breach, particularly in offices, with office managers wanting their workforce back, but a returning workforce that does not want to go back into the office because they're afraid of their safety. But as an extra element on top of this, people have gotten used to working from home and become pretty comfortable about it too. So right now, managers need to understand what they have to do to attract their workforce back. If not, they will be attracted by some other employer that are actually uh, that are um, responding to these changes in a better way. So, this being said, it's always a cost-related question. How hard is this to reassure the uh, returning workforce? How could it be done? This is a picture of our newest sensor called the View Plus in an office environment. It's probably the easiest way just to invest in the smart, smart sensor technology to reassure and give transparency. This is a battery-operated sensor, so it's making it may, so really it is easy to deploy and also to retrofit. It has a custom, customizable screen, so you can actually show the values that you want to to your workers. It has a reporting functionality, so you have like full compliance, but it also has an open API. So you can use it in a smart way. You could pull the data from this sensor into a different platform, or you can integrate and start into a BMS, and you can start using data from this sensor to do building operations and to control the temperature and ventilation within a building. And when it goes back to cost, cost is actually marginal. If you look at what companies are using today to assure to keep their workforce happy in a building, we use a lot more on coffee than assuring people of their safety today. So the cost is, I would say it's not an element in this at all, just to, for the reassurance. So think about that. Okay, so let me summarize what I've been speaking about so far. Number one, the pandemic has really educated us on the health benefits of clean indoor air, but we've also become 
more demanding, and we have higher expectation towards our surroundings. Number two, transparency on indoor air quality is needed to attract people back into spaces again. And three, reassurance can be very easily done by marginally investing in smart sensor technology. So let's lift this one layer up because now we've been talking about the health and safety aspect. But when we talk about our solution, we always talk about it in three dimensions. We talk about it in health and safety, but we also talk about it in a product productivity perspective, which a lot of the other speakers also have been uh, talking about today, but also related to energy efficiency. I think we've touched base enough on number one, so let's go into productivity and energy efficiency. 90% of a company's operating cost today is based its salaries. So what we really want to do is keep our workforce productive. But productivity can be like somewhat hard to measure. If you calculate productivity for a nation, it is typically estimated as the average gross domestic product per labor hour. And a fun fact related to this is when looking into the numbers, Norway is calculated as the most productive workforce, bringing in $75 per labor hour. What I was hoping to say today, because we're obviously a Norwegian-based company, it would be fun to say that we have gotten so much of our sensor technology into commercial buildings and everywhere that we actually like, increase the productivity of a whole nation. I, I think it's hard for me to prove that, but that would be like a good messaging. But there has been a lot of research studies has been done to investigate the correlation between indoor air quality and performance. And the outcomes of this research has shown that productivity and cognitive abilities can be increased to as much as 50% by optimizing the indoor air conditions. So look an example on this. What does that, that actually mean? It means that we can increase our output from companies with 50% with not putting any extra cost on top of that. That has a major impact on a company's bottom line, a direct impact. Just to deep dive a little bit more into how these kind of productivity tests are done. Just recently, Harvard University published a study related to productivity in workplaces. And the headline said, your office is making you stupor. What they did is the study was conducted over a year, and it included over 300 office workers from over 40 offices. Each, each worker was sent an air sensor that they were to place on their desk. It measured CO2, fine particulate matter, and it also included temperature and humidity. And through a smartphone app, workers were asked to perform several cognitive tests over a year. Researchers were literally able to see the levels of pollution around the office at the exact moment the workers were taking their tests. And the findings? Well, the more polluted the air, the slower the response time, the lower the response time and accuracy on the test. So once again, it was proven that indoor air has an effect on productivity. And you might think that this was done in bad buildings. So Joseph Allen, the director of the, uh, the, director of health build the Healthy Building Program at Harvard University, says the following. The buildings would be deemed good buildings by just anybody under the existing framework of how we think about our building. So it was an average building, meaning that productivity can be increased in almost all buildings. If not up to 50%, at least, what if we only do it by 10 or 20? It still has a major impact. So if 90% of our uh, salaries, uh, our business spend is related to salaries, what is the rest, 10%? It's related to energy and rental, which also has a significant cost for businesses today. But how much do we actually know about what's happening in a building so we could actually impact this? A short story. Mid-March 2020, mid-March, is the first time we went into lockdown. We know that our offices, our schools, our kindergartens were left empty. But what we could see, and also I think Henrik Tegel said this, is that our buildings were running for full. 
And that was in a time when a lot of companies went to, into an economic crisis. So what if we were able to just reduce the temperature with one degree? That would give us a 5% savings according to ANOVA. Or if we were able to decrease the temperature with 45 degrees with no people in the building, it would give us an amazing savings of 25%. So, but one thing is the cost aspect of the energy. But another dimension that I really mean is bigger is the energy waste, because it's linked to a global problem that we're facing, which is the global warming. So buildings stand for 40% of the energy consumption today, of the global energy consumption. What few people know is that in average, 12.5% of this leaks out of buildings. If you recalculate that, the really global problem to this is that 5% of energy use leaks out of buildings globally. I guess you sometimes have felt a draft if you're going into or exiting a building. Those drafts are related to energy leakage. And it is ma 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 mainly caused by pressure differences and fa fan and ventilation systems. So draft is something we are issued with every single day. And our immediate reaction to this is to put on more clothes. That doesn't help us with our global problem. So since I don't have much, time, it's a huge opportunity within this. And if you really want to know, because AirThings has sensor technology measuring differential pressure, which is a huge opportunity for all companies, even if, if you take like your ESG goals seriously, I recommend you to reach out to while your contact point at AirThings to get an own session, because it really deserves an own session on this. So I don't have time to go through the full thing, but there are huge opportunities in this. Because a lot of companies have outspoken ESG goals today, but no clear plan on reaching them. So this could be one of the answers. To summarize, um, one, we have recognized that our people are our most val valuable assets. Uh, and that if we do something about their productivity, we could boost our company's bottom line. We've also recognized that 5% of energy leakage today is a global problem, and it comes from the building industry, so we really need to address that. But all in all, I really believe COVID has given us the chance to actually fix indoor air pollution forever. But we need to start acting upon it and taking it seriously, starting by today. And it's not only for the people, but it is for our business, and it also is for our planet. Thank you for listening in. Thank <laughs> you.